Hi everyone and welcome. It's good to see so many friends and colleagues joining us today and we're going to get right to the program. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Maureen Droney with the Recording Academy Producers and Engineers Wing of which I believe almost all of you here with us are members. We're excited to be presenting another segment of Inside the Mix, a series we are co-hosting with Dolby as part of the Atmos Music Masterclasses. This is the second in what's planned to be at least a six-part series with episodes on everything from formats and best practices to rendering, mastering, and metadata. So note, uh, please note that after the initial live event, all of the other, all of the webinars will be reposted online and we'll let you know when they're ready and, and up for viewing. Presenting today is Brian Pennington, who led uh, the, or helped lead the music studio and enablement for Dolby Atmos Music from the beginning. He's a sound engineer who has worked on over 1,500 films and was instrumental in the Dolby Atmos rollout for film and television. Brian's been with Dolby a long time. He's tremendously knowledgeable, and we're thrilled to bring him out from behind the scenes to talk to us today on specifically room configurations and tuning. Moderating is engineer Michael Romanowski, who many of you also know. Michael is the owner of Coast Mastering in the Bay Area and a three-time Grammy recipient with two of his Grammys awarded in the Best Immersive Audio Album category. So we're gonna spend about 30 minutes on the presentation and then we've got another 30 minutes allocated for Q&A. So put your questions in the Q&A function and we'll have a good amount of time to answer them. Now here's Christine Thomas, who's Dolby's Head of Music Partnerships. Welcome, Christine. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, to everyone at the Recording Academy and in particular the PE Wing, we're thrilled to be here and we look forward to working with you through this episode and throughout the series. I'll now invite Michael and Brian on screen and remove myself and I'll see you again shortly. In the meantime, please do enter questions into the Q&A box and we will capture those for you when we break to uh, to do that twice. We'll do it once during the discussion uh, in the first half of the hour and then again the back half of the hour will be dedicated to Q&A. So do submit your questions. Thanks Christine, appreciate that. Um, nice to see you here. Thank you everybody. Thank you Maureen and the, and the p and &E steering committee and all. Um, I am uh, here we go, having a video problem. There it goes. Now, now it kicks in. Thought this was going to be just a talking head this time. And Brian, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate your expertise. We all know that what you hear in a room and listening is what guides your decisions. So this is a super important topic to be able to cover. So people, you know, know that they're making good decisions when making, you know, mix, balance, tone decisions and all of that. So thank you so much for coming out from behind the scenes and, and, uh, and having a talk with us. And with that, Brian, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Let's jump right in. Thank you. Glad to be here. So uh, why do we, why do we tune rooms? Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Pennington. I'm a senior applications engineer at Dolby, even though that's kind of a corporate title. I've been a part of uh, Atmos in Los Angeles uh, and in you know, the world for 10 plus years. I've also been instrumental in getting Atmos music off the ground. Uh, I was, you know, had my hands in, in, in the Sergeant Pepper remixes. I, so I've kind of been in the middle of it since day one and uh it's been a long fun ride but uh there's still a long way to go and we still have a lot to do so uh but let's talk today about you know setting yourself up for success and and, and tuning and and setting up your room and, and things like that so you know i mean some of this stuff i'm going to go over you kind of know but let's talk about it anyway why why do we tune rooms and you know some of that not every speaker is equal uh, and more importantly, not every room is equal. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have the best speakers in the world. If your room is not acoustically good, then chances are your mixes won't be either. Uh, the goal is to make, you know, make everything sound as equal as you can, which is not a small challenge, uh, even within the same brand sometimes. And this is true for stereo. You don't want to change the EQ of a track just because your left speaker has more high frequency than the right speaker or, or something like that. You don't want two speakers you want the two speakers to be the same so that you can make decisions that matter regardless of where you where you place that tracking mix. And the same is true for Atmos as well. But 
as you can imagine, that's way more compounded, uh, you know, lots of different choices. And with an Atmos system, every speaker is supposed to be as powerful and in full range as your mains. It is a fundamental of how the system works. And once your system is properly set up and calibrated, you should stop hearing speakers and start hearing a sound feel. Like it should just change the way you work with your with, within your system. Uh, and 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 in that in that vein, the you know towards that goal, tuning rooms uh, is what we do to kind of get some of that happening. And tuning rooms happens in 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 two basic ways and I, I kind of separate it into the physical and the electronic um, and and your approach will suit your budget sometimes it's it's one sometimes it's the other sometimes it's both it just depends on how much you how much money you have to spend and you know what kind of situation you find yourself in so just like the choice of your speakers your approach will suit you uh, and the first thing that I you know want to go over is is you know the configuration of 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 the system so uh and well and you know these are some of the other topics we're going to go through today room tuning and configuration uh we'll get into what is the curve and, and how can we help later um but uh first let's go into you know configuration the first thing is choosing the right space you know choosing what room that you're going to put this system into you don't want to make it too big or too small you know to about 10 by 15 is, is our recommended uh, room size for, for minimum standards, uh, you know, all the way up to a very nice, you know, like 22 by 25. That's a, the size of the capital room, capital C, for instance, um, but something very comfortable. But we want to stay away from stuff that's too small because you're going to have a hard time getting that to translate. So, um, you know, your budget will obviously help dictate the, 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 that space and, and, and what goes in it. So, you know, choosing your config, it, you know, will, it's, it's definitely dependent on what you have to spend. So all the gear that goes in it, all the, all the, all the, you know, how many speakers you put in, you know, what sort of configuration you're going to do. Uh, we have a tool called the Dolby Dart that we can talk a little bit about later. Uh, that can help you do uh, like audition speakers in a space, see if you can, their power handling matches, you know, where you should be putting stuff. Uh, and then, you know, one of the other considerations that I talk about in, in, in with people when they're trying to figure out how to set themselves up is what, you know, how big of a speaker at every location, uh, because I really do want you know, my left and right to be repeated as much as possible around the room so that I get less of a timbre shift as I move around the room. Obviously, that is not always uh, doable. Nobody has infinite money. Uh, so some speakers are lesser, some speakers are greater. Uh, but we do uh, suggest in those cases to do base management. Um, and base management is, is kind of a, an equalizer when it's well set up. It doesn't work uh, just off the shelf, uh, you have to pay attention to how you put it put it in. Uh, it will. Uh, it takes a good speaker controller to dial it in well. You know, uh, there there are a number of different speaker controllers that have the functionality to allow you to do uh, some really good base management nowadays. Uh, and even you know the Dolby renderer, uh, if you um, are are strapped, I guess you could say. Uh, even if even the Dolby render has a base management setting uh, and, and it has been used on uh, some mixes that everybody has heard and, and you know, respects these, you know, some of the guys out there that, that just said, you know, I, I, I don't have, I'm using an R1 or something like that. And it doesn't really have the same monitor control situation. So let's use base management and render. It works out great. It's a very, very useful tool. And then moving on to, to to you know tuning uh you know in the physical realm it has a lot to do with you know picking a room that has the right kinds of ratios you know length and width versus heights uh um you know typically we recommend a nine or ten foot ceiling to get yourself some distance between you and the overheads um but uh it it involves a lot of other stuff too base trapping absorption diffusers uh, dealing with your first reflections uh, from from all different directions, which is a little bit complex, uh, but even down to uh, resonators that you can buy or DIY yourself uh, that, that are tuned to certain frequencies to help you eliminate standing nodes and 
and uh, just situations like that, correcting the physical problems, uh, you know, before we get to other other means. Uh, but it also involves things like placements and uh, which, you know, relates to delay timings, but placements within the room, the spacings, the angles between you and the mixed positions. Uh, the Dolby Dart uh, actually even has an ITU layout guide, which helps you put in your, your, your speakers at recommended angles, like zero for the center, 30, 30 degrees off center for your left, right, uh, 50 degree, up to 50 degrees for your, for your wides and, and 90, 135, so on and so forth. There's some really handy tools in there. Um, and then, you know, one of the last things that we talk about uh, is aiming, you know, making sure that you're creating a sweet spot with your, your speaker system, uh, helping yourself aiming over your shoulders, um, making sure that everything's pointed, you know, and it's funny enough, I don't, you don't always know, but I point the speakers at the mixer. You know, uh, we've had acoustic architects that didn't, didn't really even, they didn't follow that rule. We had to kind of get onto them about that. It's like, I didn't think I had to tell you, well, here, it wasn't in the dark. Well, you know, I didn't think I needed to say that, but okay. Uh, so anyway, that's some of the physical things that we do, you know, in terms of, of setting up rooms and choosing uh, choosing what's, how you're going to help tune your system, getting rid of the standing waves. Uh, but some of the next things that we'll talk about are the electronic ways. And, you know, the, the I like to tell people that, that when we're doing room setups, I go through four, four things. Uh, and, and one is aiming your speakers, which we've already gone over. Uh, but the next one is SPL, uh, delay and EQ pretty much in that order. Those, if you can get the first three done, uh, and most everybody can get the first three done, regardless of, of what you think you can, uh, that's actually going to be, that's gonna put you, you know, a long way towards, towards setting yourself up for success. So making sure, you know, SPL, it doesn't, you know, that's kind of a, we like to tell everybody that we want them to be at 85, but that's more for that moment when your client walks in and you want to turn up the monitors and just everybody wants to feel good about the big loud music that we've got. And it's, and it's awesome just to feel the presence, but a lot of people don't want to mix that loud. And that's a completely understood, you know, so typically 70, 75 is a mixing level is, is quite fine. Uh, but my goal in, in talking about tuning and SPL is to make sure that every speaker is the same. I don't, you know, it's, it's more, I, I want to make sure that when I'm panning around the room that, that I don't have any dips and sags and bumps and, you know, like, oh, well, that, that sounded bigger over there. Well, yeah, it's because the speaker's louder. I want to make sure that everything's the same, that we're, that we're kind of dialed in that way. Usually you can do a little bit before you EQ and a little bit after you EQ just to make sure you've stayed on the same, same level. And then the next thing that we talk about is delay, making sure that all the delays are set the same, you know, and, and, and delay is something that, you know, it's most people dial in a, 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 an electronic delay, which is the most precise, but it can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. Uh, you can do, you know, a tape measure and a calculator. You can, you know, with a knowing that, that sound travels at uh, 1.125 milliseconds, uh, uh, 1.125 feet per millisecond, sorry, uh, or, you know, you can uh, uh, take a piece of string and a <laughs> strap it to a center point and stretch it to every speaker. That's your equidistant uh, setups. Uh, but with orthogonal setups, you're going to need some sort of an acoustic I mean, electronic delay. Um, and usually when I come out and do rune tunes, uh, I'm doing it uh, with a transfer function uh, using, you know, things like smart systems like that, that allow me to excite the speaker, listen to the playback. Uh, it determines how far everything is in time. And then we set them all to be the same. And when you do things like delay, getting your delays correct, that's, it's, you know, uh, Bruce, Bot Bruce Botnick told me recently that, it, that it's like magic. All of a sudden you're just, you're not listening to speakers anymore. You're listening to a sound field and you've just got this, this three, you know, like 360 degree canvas to, to, to mix in. It's not, it's not a limiting, you know, single plane up in the front of the room. You're not hearing speaker to speaker to speaker. All of a sudden it just kind of, everything starts to lock in. It feels like you're listening. You're sitting in the room with people. You're, you're, you know, you can get as intimate or as big as you want to. 
it's a really magical moment when you get those delays locked in. Uh, right. And yes, may I ask you a question? So uh, clarifying, yes. can I go back to real quick when you were talking about setting up the room diffusion? absorption, yep. speaker placement, sure. pointing, stuff like that. Can you talk about maybe some particular challenges from somebody that has a stereo room that's moving to uh, to an immersive setup, a multi-speaker setup, and some of the considerations that they may have like dialed in for a stereo, but then they're changing their format and maybe some things you've come across and maybe some things, uh, tips or considerations for folks who are wanting to do that? Well, um, you know, it's funny. I, I find in, in well set up rooms that are set up for stereo, I actually find a lot less problems than you would imagine, uh, just because somebody has actually paid attention to it in the first place. <laughs> so it's it's very useful in in that, you know, your left and right, your mirror image, uh, you know, what happens on one side of the room tends to happen on the other side of the room. Um, and and it's it's more, you know, the main challenge. Uh, that I find in those situations are standing waves down the center line uh, because we were so focused on, you know, 30 degrees left, 30 degrees right. Our center line of the room has got issues uh, that we can usually deal with uh, by, by putting a speaker up there, exciting the room, figuring out what those nodes might be and trying to figure out what sort of resonators or absorption might help that situation. Uh, dealing with that stuff before anybody shows up is really, uh, it's going to be a money saver for a lot of people because they're going to waste less time trying to figure out what's wrong. It's going to be a time saver later trying to overcome stuff in a mix. That's not, that's not well set up. Uh, but, uh, that's kind of, those are some of the, the, the tips that I would give people trying to set up a, a, a mostly stereo room moving into Atmos. Um, then there's a the whole front back, which is different than side to side. Well, right. And so there's the other center line of the room. <laughs> right. So, you know, and making sure that, you know, mixed positions, not putting yourself exactly in the center of the room is probably the best. We tend to cheat people forward or back a little bit, depending on spaces and, and how things work out, you know, like a, 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 a we recommend 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.7, which is odd, but it, it works and that was holdovers from post days, but you know, quite often we're seeing 0.45 or 0.4. And when I'm saying that, I mean like where in the room in terms of the length, should I be putting my console, you know, somewhere, I don't want it too close to the front speakers because then you'll get uh, a, a diminished front mix that's kind of large in the back, which can be good, but it also doesn't turn out exactly like you want when you translate to other spaces. Um, but we tend typically tell people to about 0.4 to 0.45. Like, so if my room's 10 feet long, I'm going to be four feet from the front wall or four and a half feet from the front wall. So that's, you know, dealing with some of the standing, standing nodes in the middle of the room, which is invariably where they're going to be. Um, yeah. So, right, a rectangular room being in the very center of a rectangular room is not the best place to be. Exactly. And, you know, and, and back to the ratios, you know, square, not the greatest. Uh, you're going to want to be in a rectangular room if you can help it. Try to orient yourself on the longer side of it, uh, you know, so that the, the the LCR is at the end of the long side or something like that. Wide is a little more difficult uh, in terms of front to back travel. Um, so uh, that's that's what I typically tell people to do. Let's 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 orient ourselves that way if we can. Um, so the last part of the electronic tuning. We'll step back into that real quick is for me, it's usually EQ. And EQ has, you know, um, many approaches. Um, you can, you could take a very broad approach to it. You could take a very narrow approach to it. Uh, minimal uh, versus minutia, you know, like how far do I go into it? I want to, I want to touch it at all. I want to, I want to make sure it's perfect. You know, it just depends. A lot of that really depends on the facility, the people, um, you know, um, what it is you want to want to get done uh, in the room, uh, problems you're trying to solve. But I will say this: EQ is not the solution for every problem. Uh, and quite often, I want to make sure that whoever is is, especially if you've got money for a, you know what. And I and I've said this before: and you know, the best money you will ever spend on any piece of gear is to actually just hire an acoustician. If you've got money to to deal with, you know, like like certain things that that ultimate piece of gear may not get you as far as hiring somebody to fix your room. Right. Like we said earlier, if your room is not good, your mixers are not going to be 
Right. You're the the thing gonna... you're making your decisions based is totally on the perception that you're hearing. And as the exactly. old saying goes, if you're on the wrong train, every stop's the wrong stop. <laughs> that is exactly correct. Right. So, you know, I try to make sure that people are, 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 are solving the right sorts of problems. Uh, you know, that's, uh, and, and, and even if you don't have the ability to, you know, later on hire somebody to come out and commission your room with you, um, you know, programs like Room EQ Wizard and Sonar Works, and there's, there's a few out there that, that, that start to do the type of job that I'm used to doing. Um, you know, they don't necessarily have the ability to, the, the AI ability to identify nodes and identify things that are, are happening. I, you can't just always pump, you know, 20 dB of EQ into a node and expect it to actually solve a problem other than it may look right on a graph, but it may not sound very good. So all of those types of programs depend on good physical setups to sound their best. Mm. Um, so, you know, with EQ, voice matching is really our main concern. And, and by voice matching, I want every speaker to, to timbrely sound as close to each other as possible which, you know, starts with choosing the right speaker system, you know, like trying to stay within the same brand, you know, with your high frequency, your low frequency as you move around the room, but it goes all the way down to dialing in, you know, base management around the room. If you, if you have a way to do that, because, because Tamberly, you know, if I don't have enough low end in my, in my surround channels, it's going to just sound different fundamentally compared to my mains. Yeah. So I, I'm trying to make sure that, as I pan around the room, you know, like when I take that, that guitar or that keyboard and I put it out, you know, if I move off of center and over down the sidewall, I don't want it to, to sound like I'm just in another speaker or something over here. I just want it to sound like that guitar or keyboard has moved over into the left wall. Right. You know, so. May I ask um, yes. how, when you're, when you're tuning rooms, how, um, uh, how much do you take into account the preference of the engineer for the sound they're looking for versus a known curve or a known um, representation or playback system? And secondarily question on that is with regards to certification and the difference between film and then uh, music, which you guys aren't doing. Correct. Well, we're, yeah, actually we're not doing certification in any space at this point, except okay. for, um, you know, in, in the in the UK and some of their territories, uh, they've been handing out uh, based on uh, abilities and things called Premier Certification, Dolby Premier Studios. That that strictly for cinematic rooms and right. has to do with size and capabilities and, and and that sort of thing. But in the in the home theater world and even you know and especially in the music world, we definitely aren't dealing with certifications. Pretty much, people. What we tell people is a suggestion. It's 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 a it's a good suggestion, but you're still up to your own devices. You know, if you decide that that's not what you want to do, then that's not what you want to do. Um, we're not trying to force anybody, but what we are trying to do is give people the tools to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, what I'm trying to say. We're trying to give people the tools to uh, get good approvals, to cut down on their notes. You know. To uh, to waste less time, so you know, especially you know, and and that's not to say that the 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 person doing the the mixing uh, doesn't know what they're listening to, but maybe they're in a new room, maybe they've set up their Atmos room in a space they've never been in, they don't really have much confidence, they don't have the time to wait six months till they get the confidence, right. they need it to go right now. So we can come in and commission a room today and say here, let me play you back a bunch of stuff that's been mixed in other studios and it sounds like it's been mixed in other studios, you know, it, it's supposed to sound, then, then I think that helps deliver the confidence to start making decisions right away. So we're, we're getting people on the road a lot faster with commissions. Awesome. Thanks. So, um, but, you know, like I was saying, voice matching is really my goal when I'm tuning a room, uh, you know, and, 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 and I, I just want things to be, you know, more the same, uh, but, uh, after all of that said, when you're tuning up your room, use what you can afford, you know, use what's available to you. Um, it, it could even come down to just using the tilts on your powered monitors, you know, your plus one, minus one high frequency, your, 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 your quarter space, half space, base controls, uh, you know, to depending on where you've set them on speakers and, and, you know, and that's part of that physical aiming and physical positioning of your system, creating 
trying to match as much as possible the timbral qualities as you move around the room to not get something that's super bassy in one speaker and the one right next to it has none. So, you know, those, those sorts of situations, do what you can uh, and, uh, and, and get your, your system going in the right direction. But use any EQ abilities and any monitor control you might have. A lot of them are packed with features nowadays. Um, you know, they can do pretty much anything you, you want. Um, EQ, SPL, delay, um, and, and to, to point out that the Dolby renderer basically has those three, three functions. If you are, are in a mastering suite and your computer, for, the computer is powerful enough, you will end up with the ability to use the EQ and the delays. Even in this version, there's still very coarse delays, you know, only a millisecond accuracy. And I know in the in a future version that they're looking at stepping that down to at least 0.1 uh, or even you know hundredths of a millisecond accuracy, so we could get a lot tighter. Um, but use those things to you know if you don't have the ability to get a monitor controller. And and like I said earlier, monitor controllers are they're really handy <laughs> when you're starting to talk about you know controlling something more than just stereo. Uh, 12 speakers, 16 speakers, depending on what you have, 14 speakers. Um, it hel helps to have a monitor controller. And there are a bunch out there nowadays. Uh, anything from, you know, JBL Nintendo uh, Studio was super powerful, uh, even for as much as it costs. The Matrix is even more powerful, uh, all the way up through uh, things like BSS and QSIS and Trinovs and things like that. You, it just whatever suits your budget level, uh, but you know anything that you can get get a hold of is really uh, what's going to be right for you, I think. So, uh, side question, because you uh, so on that having being able to do make those adjustments within the render itself, there are a handful mm -hmm. of uh, you know uh, DAWs, Pro Tools, Nuendo, and I think even mm -hmm. in DaVinci now and potentially Logic as well, where you've got the render is now incorporated into the DAW. Will those features then be something that gets added, you know, being able to carry those room tunings over to those in the future? Is that to, I, that to unfortunately I, I won't be able to answer just because those are um, um, not manufactured, but, you know, software designer specific. If they choose to put those types of controls into their programs, then then we'll see those. But we we give them the render engine and they kind of do what they want to with it. <laughs> so in yeah. terms of how it gets wrapped. So. Indeed. Indeed. This might just be a good place to take a beat. Um, terrific conversation, by the way. Thank you so much. I just want to remind everyone to please uh, submit any questions through the Q&A box. If you can, it should be at the bottom of your screens. We would love to respond to any questions. And also just to ask you, Michael, I mean, again, I know, I know there's a lot we can cover here, but are there any aspects of this, Brian? I, I don't know what else you have in mind here, but I want to make sure that we're getting to all of those questions and, and those key points of, of, let's say, the mystery. What is the what is this Dolby magic that is behind tuning a room properly for Dolby Atmos music? I mean, a lot of the the magic is just you know uh, years and years worth of experience. You know, I've been tuning rooms for for close to twenty five years now. Um, it's uh, Try, you know, getting us to come out there is to help you set up your room uh, as, as good as we can. Uh, we try to do everything we can to help people, um, like I said earlier, get, get moving forward as fast as they can, because we all understand that time is money, um, you know, time is jobs. Let's, let's keep, you know, one more, one more job under the belt uh, also is, and especially a good job under the belt is, uh, is its own PR. So <laughs> trying to keep people going forward. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things you touched on, Michael, thank you, in terms of the DAWs, you know, all major DAWs are now directly integrated um, Dolby Atmos tools, which is terrific. And that evolution continues. Um, so we've just had some exciting things happen in the last few months and there will continue to be more. There are almost 600 music studios that meet Dolby Atmos music best practices. I'm choosing my words because Brian already mm -hmm. touched on, on the fact that there's not a, a certification program. But we should just touch for a minute, I think, on the agile solutions that are available. And you've referenced some of those, you know, thus far. But I think it might be nice just to give a couple of examples and um, of those rooms. And then the other thing I would I would say for everyone to be aware 
there are resources for you as well. Um, not only are, are we reachable and certainly the p and &E wing knows how to get to us, but, um, but also professional.dolby.com is a really useful resource. There are forums. We do actually have real people reading every, every correspondence and responding directly. Um, there's a, there's a, when I talk about professional.dolby.com, you do not have to sign an NDA. That is all publicly accessible. It's not behind a firewall. We're trying to do our very best to share as much information as we can. So there are quick start videos and there's documentation, but it's also always being iterated upon. And that's very much based on, well, it's absolutely based on the feedback that we get from all of you. And so it's imperative that you provide that feedback because we genuinely want it. Um, and it might take us a minute because obviously for all good reasons, we have some process around it, but we do have a whole lot of people who collaborate to make sure that that documentation and those guidelines are reflecting what really does work in the world. If you feel that it doesn't, we want to hear from you. If you feel that something is needed to clarify or to expand upon, we want to hear from you. Um, and the other thing to note is that this is international, right? We talk about these almost 600 rooms. These are international, which means that we can't get everywhere as well, right? We do have people internationally, but that's a lot of rooms and we, we expect to see that continued growth. So we're work rate, working very closely with third-party partners, many of whom you all have already worked with and, and do work with on a, on a regular basis, your favorites, if you will, to ensure that they're also educated, capable and proficient um, and that they can also tune rooms, that they can provide the guidance. And, and so again, if you're working with someone you think that we should be enabling and leaning in with, please let us know because we are listening. With that, I'll just remind you one more time to keep submitting questions. I did notice, thank you, Christine, for that. I did notice that there was a question uh, uh, sideways, sideways to headphones. Uh, we are gonna, that's gonna be something we're gonna touch on in an upcoming, you know, in one of the upcoming episodes. That's right. And we should also mention that we will also delve deeper into the Dolby Atmos music curve, but again, in a future episode. Um, should we take a few questions now or do you guys wanna to touch on that? Sure, go ahead, okay. Brian. Yeah, that'd be good. Terrific, Thanks. thank you so much. Um, so first, are there any recommended speaker brands slash models you recommend and don't recommend for immersive productions? I'll take that one. I, I can take that one too. All uh, of them. <laughs> we recommend all. Yes, exactly. We recommend all. And we do. That's real. You want to go into it and how, why? I, you know, I mean, one of the things that I tell people, I mean, it's a mantra. We're agnostic. We work with anybody. If it, if your speaker brand is the one that you've used for 20 years and you know them backwards and forwards and we're there to work with those, you know, we're there to work with whatever you want to work with. Uh, and we're also there to work with whatever brand new models you might be interested in. Uh, we've, we've seen them all. We've used them all. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we've seen just about every configuration you can imagine. Um, the only thing that I tend to tell people is the only caveat that I usually tell people is you probably need more subs than you think you do. But that's about it. Um, and uh, every from from three hundred dollars speakers to twenty thousand dollars speakers per person, it doesn't matter. To us. The other thing I would add to that, though, too, and I think you touched on this earlier, but I think it's important because of certainly things like power and and frequency response and things like that, is to have as many of yes. them the same as possible, or at least you know the same manufacturer, exactly. perhaps that has the same characteristic. Yes, sonically. And that's, you know, one of the things that, that, uh, that, that one of the tools that I uh, referenced earlier, the Dolby Atmos room design tool is a tool that we've developed through the years that basically allows us to put in your room dimensions, um, you know, link with height, where your mix position is going to go, how many speakers that you're aiming to have in your facility. And then you can populate that with the models that you're trying to you know, like, let's say, you want to use some JBLs or you want to look at the channel X or you want to see uh, how does that compare to PMCs or, or ATCs or whatever, what models of ATCs are you really after? You know, okay, let's, let's take a look. There's a way to plug it in, see if the power handling of that speaker actually will work in your space at that distance, because distances are, you know, inverse square law. There's certain physics that we can't overcome. Um, but uh, those are the kinds of things that the dart will help you with and it'll help you, determine what the best placements are, the spacings, the angles in between speakers. It's a super useful tool. 
like I said, it also has, you know, general layout guides in it, and it will help you understand if and how much your power handling, like can you reach the 85 dB, well, we're only a, 90, a 79 uh, dB room or, or something like that. How much headroom do we have at that, at, at that volume level? Those are all help uh, uh, put forth in the dart, and that's available at professional.dolby.com, uh, which I wanted to point out, even though she didn't say it, everything on that website is free to use. Uh, all the forums, all the support, all the all of the, the the tools that are available, the webinars, everything uh, is up for grabs and education. We want everybody to be educated and empowered. Awesome. So, Absolutely. Aside, aside what's this, our next question? Or, or, or what, what's our... Uh, yep, related. Our five speakers, I'll see ours. I'm sorry. Sorry, related. Our five speakers... Okay. For the horizontal array, or does it need to be seven or nine for full immersion? Can I add a Can I add a, an addendum to that question? That's there, Christine. Well, uh, since I, yeah, um, the as you recommend rooms that somebody is going into, also the speaker setup of how many on the ceiling, you know, as a bare minimum, or what you'd like to start with, or what people might use. So taking the floor plane and also adding to the ceiling, and as you mentioned, having more subs is also helpful in more cases than not for many people. So can you talk about yep. the more sure. of a recommended room setup too? I mean, the, the, the initial recommendation from us is always going to be a 714. It's the, it's the best balance between, um, you know, too little and too much. Uh, but a lot of it always has to do with your space in particular. If you have a longer room, we're going to actually tell you that maybe another, another pair of sidewall speakers or, uh, you know, uh, maybe another pair of overhead speakers. So you can end up with a 916. We really, uh, a 714 is kind of, uh, like I said, the, the minimum, but I, I even go past and say, well, if you've, if you've got the budget, if you've got the space, if you've got the, the situation, 914 is amazing. Those wides are really awesome for music. The, just having something that's wider than stereo gives you a different kind of palette, a different kind of uh, canvas up front to, to work with. Um, so, you know, but the, the overheads, has a lot to do with how big your space is. You don't want the gaps between speakers to be too big because then no matter what your power handling is, you're gonna to start to get little, just little dips as you go around the room where, where things aren't quite keeping up as you move around the room, that constant power as you can is not quite there. So, but the Dart does actually help you determine a lot of that stuff and helps you just see what's going to work and what doesn't. And you can experiment with different placements and, and even add more than normal speakers uh, if, if your room is too big. Uh, setups with, uh, with, a, with the, uh, the renderer has the ability to do array-based stuff as well. So we've got some neat tools in, in, our, in our Dolby Atmos renderer that allows us to work with bigger rooms, like on the sides of the capital C style room or, or, or something that large. So, and, to, and to that point, that, uh, and then like you were saying, subs, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, I want to finish with subs. Um, subs, we, you know, we typically find that that most powered subs are are good for a two point one setup, but when you start um, competing with with an immersive system, you know, it just needs to have the amount of headroom that we're talking about for. Uh, you know, typical alignment, even though I said everything's at the same level, the only one that's not at the same level, uh, SPL level is the sub. It's an elevated speaker in terms of SPL. You, with a low pass considered, it is uh, typically about uh, 65 to 60 B hotter than the other speakers. So if you're at 85, you're going to want to be at a, like a 91 level SPL. But uh, that's that's from setup at, at, you know, plus 10. It, what, how do we say it? It's, it's plus 10 of in-band in gain uh, per third octave uh, band. So uh, when you low pass that, it typically ends up around five or 60 beyond. Um, and, and just having the headroom for those speakers means that you usually want a little bit more. So, um, but then also, you know, it depends on, once again, budget. Uh, it, you can try to use your, your main as your base management, but if, uh, if, you've got the, if you've got the space in your budget, Base management for your surrounds is actually another good consideration to get everything to be a little more separated, not interfering with each other signal-wise. Um, you know, keeping things uh, clean. 
Great, thank you so much. Does that, does that answer enough of the, 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 the question or? <laughs> okay. Great, thank you, yes. If not, uh, re reach out to us and we can talk more about it, yeah. Well done. Terrific, thank you. So the question <laughs> about headphones is actually, um, there's two pieces of this, good questions, by the way. Um, is loudspeaker, uh, sorry, I'm hearing a little feedback, so I'm just not sure where that's coming from. Um, is loudspeaker monitoring critical given that most of the audience will listen over headphones or binaurally? I think this this is an important question because it's actually about translation, but it's also a little bit about the market. So I'll take the market piece and then you can talk about translation, Brian. Is that okay? So speaking about the market piece, a couple of things, a fair fair point and a very common assumption. Um, but I just want to remind us about a couple of things. I'm so sorry, there is some feedback. So if you guys don't mind just checking. Um, one, in terms of consumption, there are over a billion devices that are Dolby Atmos enabled today. Um, and that a lot of those are actually in the home. And with, with COVID began the reemergence, if you will, or the reclaiming of the home environment, pretty significant investment has gone into those spaces. And of course, while we're reemerging into the world, all of us together, there's also still a pretty, it was a pretty pivotal time in terms of the change in our lifestyles. You all know that this is your this is your space as well. But just to say that what we saw in terms of pur purchasing and consumption and what what we're seeing in the world is is definitely a, a, a large standing in the home environment as well as mobile. And then of course it's very important to remember that Dolby Atmos is now in the car, right? So again, just as a reminder, already in Lucid Motors, um, already in Neo, and Mercedes has announced that they're coming to market later this year. So that's very exciting. We can we can all look forward to uh, you know continued adoption and I think we all agree that that it's working. So maybe with that in mind, Brian, can you talk to us a little about about the importance of translation? Uh of course. Um you know, I'm never going to say that that mixing in headphones only is the way to go. Uh speaker-based playback will you know, in my experience and many other people's experience is always going to yield a better mix. Um, it just gives you a better sense of what spatialization is. Uh, and it tends to um, just turn out a, a better mix all the way around. I find that when you do a mix in speakers first and then go to headphones, your translation is a much better yeah, has a much better chance of, of translating into binaural and even into stereo. Um, you're you're used you're a little more used to what that feels like and how you work. I mean, I I don't know many people that have mixed an album solely in headphones, so I don't know why we would do that for you know any binaural situation either. So I I'm always going to be an advocate for speakers, um, and um, you know I I can't say enough about it <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to to find a reason why i would do headphone only other than you know obviously you know constraints you know and in, in uh in life and budget but uh at the same time i think you should at least be even if you're going to mix in headphones i think you should you know partner with the studio that has uh, an immersive setup that allows you to go and check your mixes toward the end uh to make sure that your your you know speaker mixes is just as good because like we were saying, um, you know, all of these different venues are coming through, uh, your, your car is coming. We, we, saw, we heard some some really good uh, uh, systems and cars this year at NAMM. Um, and, um, you know, what the future of that will be is, is quite exciting. Um, and, um, and not to mention, you know, the market for home theater stuff is really uh, taking off leaps and bounds. I, every, it seems like every day I see a new uh, sound bar or upward firing speaker set or, or even, you know, an actual immersive audio set for home theaters, uh, which, you know, is, is a really powerful uh, place to hear music. Absolutely. Things to talk about, uh, we're talking about translatability. So uh, I would just add to that translatability is not necessarily from device to device, but it's also over time. And when thinking about something that plays well now and is going to play well later, listening on speakers to me is one of those things, having a well-tuned room, which is why we're here to talk about the, the tuned room aspect about it is the thing that allows it to, to me, translate over time because it's not subjective to changes of potentially right. codecs and you know how we're still learning about how the brain perceives audio and how to best get some you know, localization cues in a two-channel playback. 
Those right. things are and going to be adapting and changing over time as we get smarter and figure out new things and write exactly. new software and all of that. But the speaker thing is the time translation to me. And, and you know, one of the things that I tell people when we're tuning rooms is the closer we can get to uh, voice match symmetry around the room, the better chance we have of creating a master that, that survives the, 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 the environments that we will find out in the future, whether, whether it is headphones or some new technology that we've never heard about, you know, as long as we can try to make our, our, our masters in a, in a tuned environment, then we're, we're, you know, much further along that path. I totally agree with you there. And, and there's a point that you're that you're touching on as well, which is it's important not to mix for any one device or any one yeah. service. It's important to mix, make your music as you would, as you have, as you do, and 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 trust in that translation because you've already checked, and yeah. that the imperative message here. Um, there's a nice question that you can speak to as well because of the work that you're doing, Brian, with Dolby Live. This is, do you see app must being adopted by nightclubs and concert venues? Can you, you tell us how to be live? Are you tuning, tuning concert venues also? Besides the setting up of the system. Yes, I am. Awesome. I mean, uh, we're, we, <laughs> Um, I, I was part and parcel to uh, standing up the Dolby Live venue in Las Vegas this year, um, which our first shows were supposed to be with uh, Aerosmith coming up. But, uh, you know, Steven Tyler is, is, uh, is taking care of himself and I applaud him for that. Um, but, um, you know, we will see them back again and we've, we've got some other artists on the hook. Uh, but we are setting up, uh, you know, the Park Theater is now called the Dolby Live. Uh, it's a 4,500 seat venue with a full Atmos system in it. And by full, I mean, you know, coverage all around the room, line arrays where they're appropriate, all the way down the sidewalls, all the way across the front. Uh, we want to every person to have as good of a, uh, a playback experience as possible, you know, a performance experience as possible. And when I take, and this is part of why we tune rooms. I've taken, you know, music that has been mixed in, you know, regular studios, uh, regular Atmos studios that we know and love that a lot of us have been in. And I've played that back in the, in the Dolby Atmos, uh, in the Dolby live venue. And it sounds like our music, but played back in a really big space with, with those types of considerations, you know, yes, it is 200 feet for me to that speaker or something, but, and, and, you know, it does sound different, but is it drastically? No, it is not drastically different. I hear my movements. I hear my, my balances. I hear my, my overall mix is there, you know, and when we make those decisions and, you know, and this is true when we tune rooms too, you know, we end the day uh, after a tuning with listening and making sure that things are translating the way we expect them to, that, that those little parts in that one song poke through in the right way, you know, and all that balance is there. That's the same thing that we were doing in those in that large venue, and uh, it is it is uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, a lot of people were were just floored at how well it was working. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun here in the next you know couple of years. We're going to see a lot of really amazing new technology. Do, do you have any any different any like uh, different approaches to live versus studios versus you know the obviously reflections and controlled environments and speaker placement choices you may have? Do you have you know any any differences any you know? Uh, I mean, we, approaches that you yeah. Good. I, the 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 main difference would just be you know letting easing into what people are used to in those environments. Uh, and letting the tunings do what they're supposed to do and, and not trying to interfere too much in how that is already working, how the, the front of house mixer expects things to be. And, and you know, and, and that's typically what we do when we tune the rooms with Dolby as well, I mean, uh, with uh, music studios and Dolby as well, is that we're not drastically different than, you know, what you expect. I mean, people look at our, at our tuning curve and, 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 they're like, man, that looks drastic. It's like, well, it's a lot better. It's it's a lot closer to what you you use than you think you do. <laughs> Most of the time, it's it it works out, especially in the live venues that that people are just excited about the way it sounds and uh, and uh, it's just small tweaks for the most part. It's nothing crazy. Amazing. We have. But, 
but I will say, and I, this is something that, that let me add one more thing that it, just like I was talking about earlier, voice matching was one of the things that I really paid attention to in that venue, which, you know, probably drove the uh, El Acoustics guy a little crazy. Uh, but it was, it really still is about voice matching all the way around the room, trying to get things to speak from every speaker uh, stack the same way. Yeah, that's an so essential component that, that for, the, for, the for it to work. Absolutely. Terrific. I want to, I'm going to exactly. take one more question if that's all right. Um, and I'm going to promise John Merchant that we will, we will send an, a response because you need a little bit more detail to your question about how you can play back streamed music from your lounge, loudspeakers. So we'll, we'll take that as a follow-up action if you can forgive us for that, John. Um, but uh, Leslie Ann asked, you could just start with 512 or 514 if that's how you want to get started, right? I mean, you can. We typically don't recommend anything less than 514. And, and, and to touch on what we were talking about earlier, one of the reasons that we, that we talk about how to get this, you know, uh, why we recommend a 714 it's about hearing that space, hearing the travel. I want to be able to hear my pans as it, as it goes by me. Uh, I want to be able to hear the difference between the front of the room and the back of the room. Uh, so typically I don't recommend a point two overhead uh, just because I want to make sure that, you know, we're not limiting someone by choosing uh, just a stereo overhead, but it, that's really kind of the breakdown of why we recommend what we recommend. A 514 is, is pretty much the minimum that we've ever recommended for a music center. Well, and again, the difference between cinema and music, having looking at two overhead as a potential array because of the raked floor, for example, or. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you can still do, uh, you know, a stereo, you can still hit a nine one two um, a, a nine one or 712 out of Pro Tools and hit a stereo overhead and both of those speakers will play it. Um, but it does, it just does benefit us uh, like with an object being able to hear movement through the room and, and just more precision. You know, um, I, I push people to use as much precision as they can afford. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Actually, I'm so sorry, gentlemen, but if I can squeeze in one more, if it's okay. Of course. This is a good question because it's about sweet spot. Um, so let's give this one a minute. Could you, and then we should wrap Michael just as a heads up. Um, could you go more into how you manage multiple sweet spots in the case of a large space versus a single, maybe two person room? Well, in a small room, you know, small rooms have small room problems. Uh, and, and pretty much, you know, when you're in a 10 by 15 room with a console and maybe a, a couch in the back of the room and you're pressed for speakers, big speakers up in the front of the room, you're, you're pressed for space. So there's pretty much only going to be one place to really sit down and, and, and uh, you know, and this is the case in any, even in a stereo room, you're not going to be able to truly, you can't sit back in the back corner and make a great decision. Um, but, you know, so I tell people, if you've got something to, to decide, if this is the sign off moment, sit in the middle, you know, give up your spot, let the client sit there, let them hear what you're doing. But when we talk about a bigger room, Atmos is, is not necessarily, and, and this is why a center speaker is very important. It, it really keeps your front imaging the same. Your sweet, spot, your sweet spot because of a center channel gets so much bigger. You can move around the room and still hear your spread across the front. You can still hear uh, how, how the music is unfolding. Every every part of the room is still a valid place to be. Um, you know, is it the exact same thing that the mixer heard? No, but you're going to hear a different version of the mix, but still equally as compelling quite often. Uh, you know, I've worked with a lot of mixers who, who make a point of not just sitting in the sweet spot when they mix. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with they want to they want to know. You know, David Leonard was he I'd always sit, watch David stand up and kind of walk over to the left and walk over to the left back and the right front and just go, what's coming out of here? What's coming out of here? What's coming out of here? Just because he wants to know what's going to happen whenever you're not in the sweet spot. And part of that is just, you know, changing, not just sitting in the middle of the room when you're mixing as well. 
It's, so. it's super important not to be not to, to, to experience it from all the way around. Um, just one, one follow up to that real quick, uh, if I may, is that when you're tuning a room, then because of uh, as regards to that question, are you tuning in multiple spots or are you looking at a particular place? Are you taking averages in different places or are you? I, I when I tune rooms, I always use multiple microphones. Uh, with smart, you have the ability to, to do what's called a power average, uh, where you, you set your microphones. I tend to, to not, I put one microphone in the middle of the room, but then I have three at the bolster and a couple back here. And it's really just kind of a, I need to take an average of a larger space. So I'm not trying to put it back against the back wall or all the way out to the sidewall. There's limits to, to what's, uh, you know, good practices, but you know, we timed to one spot in the room. And then we use the average of the microphones for, you know, our, our spectral balance. So that's very typical. I, you know, and some people swear up and down that using one microphone for tuning is the best way to do it. And that's true in certain situations, you know, mainly above 1K, getting your, your, your high frequency dialed in is pretty, pretty normal. It will, it will stay pretty, pretty similar around the room. But below about 1K or 500, you start to get lumps as you move around and getting a better average, not because you could be putting your microphone right in one of the nodes and, and it'll, it'll throw everything off. So especially when you start talking about what we were saying earlier, that there is a, a middle node, but there's also a side to side node and another axial node, you know, so you, you've got to be careful about where you put your microphone. If you're only using one, that's why we tend to use a lot. Uh, usually six, as many as eight, depending on spaces. It, it just depends. Awesome. Thanks. Gentlemen, thank you both so much. I'll just, uh, if there are further questions offline, if you email music studios team at Dolby.com, we're very happy to help. And again, thank you to Brian and to Michael for have, you know, pr providing this incredible presentation today. And thank you to the Recording Academy for having us. Thanks, Christine. Thanks back to you and Brian. Really appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And then to Maureen. Hi guys, looks like I don't have my video. Um, I just wanted to say thanks, of course. And if you found this valuable, uh, tell your friends about this episode and about the series. And as we mentioned, ultimately the entire series will be posted for public viewing. So if you found it valuable, tell your friends. Um, I also, uh, Leslie Ann, who's watching has, oh, there we go, start my video. Um, uh, Leslie Ann, who's uh, listening in, Leslie Ann Jones said, can we please tell you about what's upcoming for the next, what we're planning for the next of this series, and that is Creative Solutions, um, most likely with David Gold and John Scanlon from Dolby. Um, and we're going to talk about what is the renderer, what's the production suite, what's the mastering suite, do I need a renderer, is my DAW enough? And do I need to use the Dolby Panner? So all sorts of stuff like that coming up. So we hope we see you again and tell your friends. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.